Hello, everybody. Next up, we play host to AFC Bournemouth. Kickoff on Monday night is at 8 pm, which is for the benefit of Sky TV. Bournemouth are on their second manager of the season. It was an indifferent start to the season. Beating Villa didn't really count. And that was followed by matches in quick succession against Manchester City, Arsenal and Liverpool. They shipped seven goals between the first two of those games before going up to Anfield, where they shipped a further nine to Liverpool. Perhaps if there'd been something different about the order of those results, say they'd let in the nine to Manchester City instead of Liverpool, Scott Parker might well be at a job now, but that was just the final straw for the owners. On past history, maybe they ought to have gone and found Matt Upson and sacked him instead. But having established that Parker really was in charge, shortly after, he wasn't. So at the moment, they have another ex-hammer in charge as interim manager, caretaker manager really, in the form of Gary O'Neill. Since his appointment, the results have improved, arguably as a result of not having had to play Manchester City, Arsenal and Liverpool every week. As if to emphasise that point, their two wins over the ensuing period came at Forest and at home to Leicester. They did pick up a series of draws over that period, going six games unbeaten in total before they went down 1-0 at home to Southampton in midweek, all of which has left them in 13th place with 13 points and a goal difference of minus 13. Not a good time to be a Cherries fan if you're superstitious then. Daisy informed me that they adopted the Norwich strategy on promotion, that being not to spend too much money. We released Ryan Fredericks back into the wild on the expiry of his contract, whereupon he signed for Bournemouth, where first-team football was obviously going to be more available. Blackburn midfielder Joe Rothwell came in on an identical deal with his contract at Rovers having expired at the end of last season. At 27, he's three years younger than Fredericks, a fact possibly reflected in the fact that Rothwell was given a four-year contract as opposed to Fredericks too. £12 million was the amount paid to Middlesbrough for midfielder Marcus Tavernier. He was capped at various levels for England, but his international career stalled at under-21 level, presumably due to anyone of that age who was any good already being in the full squad. Still, at least he has bragging rights over his brother James, who's skipper north of the border over at Rangers. They picked up Barcelona keeper Neto on a free. Now, when I think of great Brazilian players of the past, my thoughts turn to the 1970 World Cup of Pelé, Jarzino, Tostao, Rivellino and so on. However, they've never been blessed with great keepers. That squad in 1970 had Felix in goal, his cat nickname being due to his defenders having kittens every time the ball went near him. However, he seems to have acquitted himself as well as can be expected since arriving on the south coast, though with his one full international cap having been granted over four years ago, I suspect he'll be watching the World Cup from home on the widescreen with the rest of us. The only other fee paid out was the £10.5 million paid to Feyenoord for Marcos Senezi. The Argentinian defender gained his first cap in June, though that might be a bit late for him to have had a run with a view to go to Qatar. He's featured in 8 of the 11 league matches played so far. Uh, time is short, so let's move on, shall we, to the wild and wacky world of association football. And it was egg on FaceTime over at Sky as they announced that Lazio striker Chiro Immobile was a major doubt for the World Cup due to a hamstring injury. It seems that the minor detail of the Italians not actually qualifying for Qatar eluded the powers that be at Sky HQ. You know you've messed up in life when it takes Paul Merson to tell you the error of your ways. Meanwhile, as I sat in the pouring rain on the M3 after the Southampton game the other week, waiting for the queue to start inching its way past Basingstoke, I had one of those ideas that's so brilliant, I'm baffled why nobody's come up with it before. Now picture the scene. You arrive at the Olympic carrying a bottle of water. Maybe your preferred brand of soft drink. Just something to keep your throat lubricated before you go out and sing bubbles. Then you get to the queue to get towards the stadium, where the stadium owner's highly trained squad of security personnel search you and your belongings. Their rigorous training regime has taught them to spot a bottle cap from a mile away, and gleefully they remove it, leaving you to enter the ground with a drink that slowly loses its fizz before being knocked over, possibly turning your matchday programme into a soggy mess. Now this seemed a bit unfair, so I got to thinking... If only there was something that the security team always let through without a second glance. And that's when I had my Eureka moment. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you 
Percy brand imitation distress flares, indistinguishable from the real thing. Instead of containing powdered gunpowder, Percy flares contain space for up to 10 bottle caps, 100% guaranteed to be allowed past security. This is the sort of thing that will make our country great again. And don't try and nick the idea, our lawyers will be watching. On the subject of matters sort of legal, you may recall the debacle earlier on this season that was East Midlands Railway's attempt to organise the proverbial inebriated drinks party in an establishment dedicated to the brewing process. To refresh your memory, the ten coach train, assigned for the purpose of transporting people twixt St Pancras and Nottingham, had five coaches locked out of use due to the company's failure to ensure that there were two train managers on duty to take part of each part of the train. This was composed of two separate five-coach sections. And this was bad enough, but rather than admit its culpability in causing the overcrowding and subsequent delays, the company issued updates blaming the problems on the fact that a football match was taking place, the implication being that those nasty supporters were somehow the cause of all the problems because of their bad behaviour. Given that temperatures on board that train that day were so high it would probably have been illegal to transport livestock alongside them, behaviour of supporters was exemplary, so the train company's misleading output was annoying in the extreme. After much chasing and cajoling, your correspondent's finally been offered an as yet unspecified amount of compensation. Though I still await comment on why they felt it acceptable to publish statements that were borderline libelous to cover up their own incompetence, watch this spate for further updates. And so to us. The other night, same old, same old, the first half saw a struggle to keep the ball with predictable consequences. The penalty brought into sharp focus exactly how bent the refereeing is up there. Whilst the home side got awarded free kicks and penalties as a matter of routine as soon as anybody goes to ground, a solid knee to the back in mid-air in that challenge on bone was incredibly waved away at well at first. One can only presume that this was due to the incident happening to a player in the wrong colour of shirt. The fact that VAR was required at all says it all. You can bet they tried everything not to award the spot kick. PGMOL apologists, Mike Riley Esquire, will point at the fact they got it right with the technology without ever trying to address why it wasn't given in the first place. And consider this. What if Atwell had been on VAR instead of on the pitch? Once the kick had finally been awarded, we had the unedifying sight of Van Dyke scuffing the penalty spot while they engaged on delaying tactics. I would say something about how sad it was to see a club to descend to such levels, but frankly, they've always been like that. They're a bit like Revy's Leeds, only with better PR. Bowen should have scored, of course, and we need to sort out the penalty situation quickly, as we're missing far too many of the blighters at the moment. Liverpool were hanging on at the end, something even acknowledged by their in-house cheerleaders at the BBC, so it must have been a bit worrying. Oh well, onwards and upwards. Paqueta was missing from the squad on Tuesday, having been kicked all over the place with zero protection from the officials down at Southampton. He picked up ligament damage to his shoulder, though the prognosis is a couple of weeks rather than the month that was originally feared. Dawson and Cornet are also a bit closer to a return. Prediction? Well, although both teams lost in their last outings, I reckon we can take more heart out of our defeat than they can out of theirs. The fact that we ought to have got more from Anfield should be a Better for the old confidence. For that reason, I'll be sending the £2.50 I was going to use towards the purchase of a copy of the Kids Guide to the World Cup for Sky will instead be sent to the Winston Turf Accountancy app and placed on a wager for a home win. I should say 2 1 to us. Enjoy the game. <laughs> So we're here in the offices of a late late show with the host of a late late show, James Corden. Hi. Big West Ham fan. Yes. <laughs> and big knees up Mother Brown man. Yeah. Get on the forum at KUMB.com. Come on you irons. <laughs> <laughs>